Good afternoon. I'm going to take this off because I kind of like to walk around a little bit. And just so you know, so you don't, for those who feel the need for obsessive compulsive like myself, if you feel the need to um, take notes, don't worry about it because the presentation is going to be uploaded to the website so you can have the presentation because of the amount of time we have, I want to make sure that we just have time to talk about succeeding in proposal development. Okay. There we go. We're going to talk about four main topics. Some of them we'll go through a little bit quickly. Some of them we'll spend a little more time on. I find it very, let me just start, I find it very funny. I don't know if it's a southern thing or not. Keep in mind, based on the introduction, I'm originally from New York. I've been here almost 14 years, so I do feel I have some southern culture, maybe not as much. But it is southern culture that everybody always go back to the back of the room, no matter where you are. I don't know why that is, but it just, whether you're at church or in class, I guess, everybody always congregates in the back of the room. And someone, maybe this is a great study for somebody here, should do a research thesis on the capacity of people to sit in the back of the room wherever they go. I don't know what area of the social sciences that would be. All right. How many people here, just to get an idea, how many people here work with faculty who you're working on a contract or grant, or for yourself, you submitted proposals for a fellowship, for a scholarship, for um, funding to do research? Anyone? All right, a few people. All right, that gives me an idea of some people's backgrounds. One of the first things I want to talk about are sources of funding opportunities, where you can go to find opportunities. In the office of sponsored programs, we have a person in our office who helps people to do that. So if you have an idea and you don't know where to look for funding, there's a person in our office, his name is Mark Ann. And at the end, if you have time, I'll show you our website. If not, I will stay around a little bit and show people our website to how to find access to his information. As well as, the university subscribes to a commercial database that we pay the cost, the university pays the cost, for people to go out and search. It's called Pivot. And Pivot is a database that contains a lot of different opportunities, both federal and non-federal, for people to seek funding. So, and you can search for keywords. So you, if you work in an area of Legionnaires disease, for instance, you could type in certain keywords related to that, and it will come up with opportunities that are out there. What's better yet is it will also tell you the eligibility, because it's very easy to get excited about an opportunity and to see a lot of money available from the sponsor, and then find out that you wouldn't necessarily be eligible for that funding. In addition to commercial databases, which you can pay for, which I don't recommend, especially at this level, and when there's so many other resources available through both the university and through the web, the web is a great resource. You can go to sponsor websites. You can go to, for instance, is anyone, anyone familiar with the National Science Foundation? Okay. Or the National Institutes of Health. If you go out to their websites and just search for grants, you'll come up with a lot of information. And there are a lot of programs that are geared towards both pre-doctoral, post-doctoral, fellowships, student programs, as well as, you know, when you get further and you're doing things from a faculty level, a lot of different research programs at that level. So sponsor websites are a good area to go to. RSS feeds. I was very excited. I was very excited with myself because about a year ago, I got hooked up with starting to do RSS feeds. It took a very long time. I'm not one of these people who haven't even tweet. So I was very excited to Facebook. And the only reason I Facebooked at first was to watch what my children were doing. Um, now I've actually become more, um, I guess the word would be obsessed with it. Um, so RSS feed, that's another resource. If you go out to many websites nowadays and you see the RSS feed logo, you can have information sent to your computer that way. The one thing I would caution about doing that, again, going to different websites, going to, um, through Pivot, which through our office, you can get to and access, and as long as you have your Auburn.edu designation for your email, you have that free. All these things are great opportunities, but you also want to be cautious because you don't want to start filling up your email boxes with information because that's what happens. You get a lot of things coming your way, and it's near impossible to start cutting all that off. So one of the best 
pieces of information or advice I would have, when you do sign up for something to have information sent to you, be as concise as possible regarding the area you are looking for in research. So when I said Legionnaire's disease before, that's a very high level topic. You really want to be sure to drill down to a specific area that you work with in order to make sure that what you get sent to you is targeted rather than more broad. I need to stop hitting the wrong button. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about writing a proposal. Before you can write a proposal, this is before you even put pen to paper, there are three things you really need to know. The first is to know your sponsor. When you're planning to submit a proposal, you want to, the main goal is to bring in funding for whatever purpose you have in mind. But you want to know what is the mission of who you're going to be sending that request to. What do they find? You really don't, this is an example I gave, and I give this example to faculty as well. You don't really want to submit a proposal to the Department of Energy for studying heart disease in mice. It sounds basic. But it's true, you really want to be sure that what you're doing and what you're proposing is going to the right group. Because a proposal takes a lot of work. And you really don't want to put your heart and soul into something and find out that, and waste that time, and it's not a waste of time, but take that time to send it somewhere and then find out, you know what, this doesn't fall within the criteria of what we do, so we're not even going to review this. Or it's going to be reviewed and reviewed negatively. So those are some of the things. You know, how how much do they normally fund? A lot of organizations will tell you when you review their documentation on submitting a proposal that is called a solicitation or a request for proposal, they'll tell you about how much money is available. So if they say that we're going to fund about 10 proposals for $300,000 each, I would recommend submitting a proposal for $500,000. You have to keep in mind what they've got available. And who is their customer base or constituencies? These are, this is important to know because, again, in some cases, when you're working with a sponsor, maybe a nonprofit such as the um, American Heart Association, you know, what are they funding? Who's their customer base? Who do they work with regularly? And in many cases, it's medical doctors who are doing the research. In other cases, it's hospitals, clinicians, things along those lines. You want to know where that target audience is. And how will the proposal be reviewed? Different organizations have different ways of reviewing proposals. Some do it by committee. Some do it by a board. The entire board just meets and decides. Others farm out their proposals to people with expertise in that area, in academic institutions like Auburn, and ask them to come back with reviews. It's important to know that because, again, we're talking about your target audience. When you're writing a proposal, it's very useful to know who's going to be reviewing that. So that's number one, know your sponsor. Number two, know your organization. Why is this important? Again, similar to the sponsor, if you submit a proposal that doesn't tie into what your organization does or what they do on a regular basis or can support, you're going to have a problem. And what resources are available to you? It's great to say I work at Auburn University, and I have the backing of Auburn University in all I do. But believe it or not, sometimes it's problematic to say you have certain resources available to you if those resources are committed to someone else or committed in another way. And better yet, and even more importantly, in today's economic climate, who else can you partner with when you submit this proposal? There's very limited funding. Everybody who knows we've heard about the fiscal cliff that we narrowly avoided last month and that still we have issues coming up in March. You know, funding, especially from the federal government right now, is difficult to obtain. So is there a way that you can shore up your proposal by working with a colleague and having submit an interdisciplinary proposal rather than just a single investigative proposal? And more importantly, and this is a plug on my office, who has to approve your efforts? No matter where you go, whether you stay over and you go to another institution, you get a postdoc position, Wherever you go, there's going to be some office that will need to be in the chain of approval for a proposal that goes out of the door of that institution, whether it's your department head and dean, as well as a sponsor programs office like mine, or whether you go out and work in industry, there's going to be contracts offices that do this type of thing for a living. 
So know ahead of time, because it's great to know you have to submit a proposal, and I'll be honest, I have been here almost 14 years, and we still get people who say, oh my god, I didn't know this had to go through your, your office. And, it's, and what's worse is, they say that on the day the proposal is due. So, you know, I've lost a lot of hair in 14 years. Not that I ever really had that much to begin with. And the third and final thing is know your project. So you now you know who you sponsor, who you're working with, who you're proposing to send this to. You know the organization you're currently at and what they support and what they do. Now you need to know what you want to do. That sounds rather basic, I guess, or elementary, but sometimes this is when you get ready to put pen to paper. Before you do that, you really have to think it through of what, what do you want to accomplish? Who is your target audience going to be? What expertise do you have available to you? What else has been done? Because it's very important to know what's been done. Because if you submit something to an organization, to a sponsor, to request funding, and work has been done on that already, and you don't recognize that, it's going to show that you didn't do the background research. And then finally, who benefits? Depending on who the sponsor is, who benefits is a very important question. And we'll talk a little bit about that. There are standard components to a proposal, but I'm going to give the caveat that these components may change depending on how you're submitting your proposal. For instance, a transmittal letter is important, and we'll talk a little bit about each of these. A transmittal letter may not be required if you're submitting your proposal electronically. And I've gauged that about 85% of all proposals now get submitted electronically through different mechanisms. But these are the proposal components. We'll go over each one in a little bit of detail as we go through. As I said, a transmittal letter identifies who you are and the special characteristics of the proposal. Believe it or not, even in the era of electronic communication, we still have sponsors that even when you submit a proposal electronically, want a letter uploaded to provide this information separately. It seems duplicative, but we do whatever we have to do in order to try to get the money. Um, so transmit a letter. Normally it just introduces who you are and what's important about the project. A title page. This is quickly identifying relevant information that you will have in that proposal. So it would include the title of your project, who the project's um, being requested for funding, information about your institution, your name, other people involved, contact information, the amount you're asking for. This page, depending on where your proposal is going, may be something you create, or it may be a form that's built on the system. Has anyone submitted proposals electronically? For those who submitted, what system? Uh, NSF and NIH. So Fastlane? Yeah. OK. Fastlane. Grants.gov, OK. Which system did you submit? Uh, OK. <laughs> no problem. Anyone else? Okay. There is a system, um, it's called Grants.gov. And originally it was anticipated that the Grants.gov system would be a storefront for all federal agency submissions, which those of us in the research administration community got very excited because it's like, yes, streamlining, we're obsessed with compulsive, we like that. Um, the problem was a lot of the agencies couldn't agree on certain components that they wanted to see in their proposals. So you had some that used Grants.gov and others that created their own electronic systems. So in our office, we get to be rather schizophrenic on today, if you're submitting this system, you do this, and tomorrow, if you're using this system, you do that. So that was just my own rant. But a title page is something that would probably be electronic, no matter what system you do, if it's an electronic system. An abstract. Believe it or not, most people write the abstract first. In my mind, that's doing it backwards. The abstract is usually, in most cases, a sponsor limits an abstract to one page. When you're limited to one page, you've got to be concise. Some are even shorter with how many words they want in an abstract. But most will do to one page. In order to write a one-page description of your project, you really have to have a project written first. And oh, one thing I didn't forget to mention on that, it is the first impression that reviewers will get on what you are about to say. So 
So if you start out with an abstract, that one page doesn't catch their attention, or you know, it just is something that's not received well, it may affect their view of the rest of the document, or God forbid, even force them not, you know, lead them to not even go further. Table of contents. General document, listing the sections. Most electronic systems will automatically generate this for you. And introduction. We're going to have to talk about three sections that lead. It's kind of like one of those Russian nesting dolls. Each of these session, sections lead to the next one. Your proposal needs to have an introduction. Your introduction is, what is the problem? What is the need that needs to be met? Why is it important to do this? And a review of the literature to show what's been done and what needs to be done. Remember, as I said previously, you want to recognize what's been done in the past. So, introduction's done, that's saying what's to come. Your objectives are, okay, I've recognized what the problem is. I'm now going to talk about what needs to be done and what I'm going to do in order to address that problem. Each statement in an objective is tied to an introduction to an, a need that is identified in the introduction. So if you say in the introduction you have five different needs, you should have five different objectives. Otherwise, leave those needs out. Or say, you know, there are five needs in this area, but I will be addressing only three of them. Make sure there is a tie-in. And in the procedures. You talk about what the need is, you talk about what you're going to do, now you're going to talk about how you're going to do it. And this is a very important part of the write-up. In fact, it's usually the document that uses the most pages. And when we talk about pages, most federal agencies and some nonprofits that you'll submit a proposal to, um, or state agencies, have limits on how many pages these sections can be, and that's usually incorporating the introduction, the um, objectives, the procedures, and any evaluation or outreach activities being done. There's normally a limit to how many pages that is. So being concise is important because the era of submitting 60-page narratives and a proposal are no more. I can't believe people ever really were able to sit and go through that because you've got to look at it from the perspective of the reviewer. You know, you're not the only one submitting a proposal, and if they've got to review 60 pages of narrative for 150 people, by about the third one, I'm not happy. <laughs> so, being concise is very important. Just to give you an example of some of the page limits, the National Science Foundation limits the project description to 15 pages. National Institutes of Health, depending on which program it goes to, it's 12 pages for an R01 project, which is a large-scale research project which could be over a million dollars. 12 pages, and in some smaller programs that they do, eight pages. Think about that for a moment. Think about something in your mind that you want to talk about doing, and think that you be concise enough to get that out for somebody to read and make a funding, up, a funding choice on in eight pages. So see, for all of you who skipped English class, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should say that, I was a political science major. Um, then, the next component, evaluation. It's important in addition to knowing what you want to do and how you're going to do it and broadcasting that to an audience, it's important to mention how you're going to evaluate progress. Because most sponsors want to know, you know, if I'm giving you $100,000, I want to know what you did with that $100,000 and was it successful. You'll have to report, there'll be reporting requirements for most sponsors you work with, you'll have to submit reports. But at the proposal stage, you want to let them know that this need is so important, this project is so important to be conducted, that we're going to do something to evaluate it. And what that something is is entirely up to you. It often involves a third party expert. And not every area of research or extramural funding is an opportunity to have to be evaluated. If you're seeking funding for um, support for thesis development, you're not going to tell a sponsor, oh, by the way, in addition to doing this project, I'm going to have someone come in and evaluate me doing my thesis. That's what the thesis committee is for. Um, but it depends on the project. Not every project would have an evaluation component. But it's important if you're doing something that can 
that you consider that and put that in your proposal. Then that's what I just talked about is the brunt of primarily where your heart and soul gets skewed on the paper. That introduction, the objectives, and um, the procedures. Anyone familiar with the National Institutes of Health? Find anyone from the National Institutes of Health? They talk about specific aims. Those are where your procedures fall, are the specific aims. But now we're going to talk about other components of the proposal that, while not necessarily you know, your bread and butter, because that's all part of the science, so to speak, or part of the write-up you've already done, these are parts of the proposal that tells a sponsor about what you have available to you and what capabilities and expertise you have to be submitting this proposal. So again, describing resources, available equipment, qualifications of personnel. Now keep in mind, if you're doing a field study out in the woods um, on the Columbian ground squirrel, which is actually a project, I was got to kick out of that and I saved the printout of that, you know, because I, you know, Columbian ground squirrel, Columbian coffee, yeah. But anyway, um, I find humor in the weirdest things, I apologize. Um, but I've been here 14 years, so I hope that's explanation enough. When you talk about what you're doing, and you talk about field work being done, recognizing, telling somebody in your facilities that the department has an x-ray machine available is not necessarily relevant. I've seen a lot of people do proposals and give a kitchen sink list of everything that they have sitting in the department, including the secretary who sits around the corner. You know, if you're doing a field study and you're going to be in Guatemala for nine months out of the year doing your field work on the Columbia Ground Squirrel, the secretary sitting around the corner and the x-ray machine in the lab are not necessarily relevant for that project, so don't include it. Um, and I'll be honest, people do it all the time, and I'll be looking, and I'll be looking at the scope of work and going back and forth going, I don't see it. And when I ask somebody, they'll usually say, well, they're asking what's available. Yes, but being available and being necessary for the project are two different things. References. Throughout your project, you're going to be referencing different works that have been done. You're going to be talking about what areas of work has been done already. Well, it's important to ensure that you're aware of the current work in the field. Because like I said earlier, if you're not aware of what's already being done, a reviewer is going to look at that and say, you know, this person has already had three publications come out regarding this, and this new person submitting a proposal doesn't reference those proposals out there. How, how much expertise do they have in this area if they don't even know about the current partners? And an appendices, and this is pretty much just a catch-all. Any, every, any, everything and anything else you would need to include in your proposal would fall in the appendices. But keep in mind, it's very important from the very start, as I talked about, knowing your sponsor. When you want to submit a proposal and you go out on the web to one of those wonderful resources available and you find an opportunity to submit to something, read it thoroughly because, again, with the era that we're in now, the economics of funding being very competitive, if you submit things to a sponsor that they did not ask for or specifically disallow, it's so easy to get a proposal for the next, you know, next best thing in the road game, for those of us who need it, um, and it won't get anywhere because it got bounced for an administrative reason. And we've had, that's one of the things I try very hard when we talk to faculty about total development is, in short, you know, in knowing what you want to do is really, really, really important but you really don't want to start yourself off on the wrong foot by putting in something that may not go forward to even be reviewed for the science. And that's very frustrating if you've got something that's a great opportunity, but it gets knocked out because you uploaded 18 pages of the narrative rather than 15. Or you uploaded, um, I'm trying to think of something I've seen. You uploaded, and this, this is just a little trick, you don't ever do it. If I find out you did it, I'll find it. Um, People say, okay, I'm stuck with the 15-page narrative. Ah, but there's a section on those appendices. I got a few more things to say. I'll just load it as an appendix and add another three pages. Could anyone tell me, this is a test to make sure everybody's awake, could anyone tell me why that would be problematic? What does it do for that proposal? 
if you get three extra pages of text. Different people review different sections of the proposal, so your narrative may, your entire narrative may not be reviewed by that particular person. Your appendices may, may be given to someone else. That's, That's quite possible. possible. If it gets read at all. If it gets read at all and didn't get pulled because it wasn't compliant. And there's another reason as well. You submitted 15 pages of narrative, you uploaded another three in your appendices. If I'm somebody who submitted a proposal to the same program and you know stayed within the 15 pages, that's a detriment to my book. It's a detriment to my proposal because I was compliant and then you've got three more pages to make your case, which is why most agencies will throw that right out because they're saying you're provided, you're attempting to receive a competitive advantage that this individual didn't have. So keep that in mind as well. I you know, one of the things I have sat with faculty and with people before to go through announcements to say, okay, make sure you follow this instruction, this instruction, and instruction if implicitly. Because believe it or not, and I always share this, this happened probably, I, I'll never forget it, even though it happened in 2000. The National Science Foundation has limits on the size of the font. And again, for the same reason, because someone who stays in 12 point font as opposed to someone who does 8 point font, you do 8 point font, you fit a lot more in 15 pages. And trust me, people know how to work the system. Well, and come on, try being a reviewer and reading 8 point font. Again, one of those things that's really going to tick somebody off. Um, so, we said we were working on a proposal and we explained to the person submitting the proposal, it looks like your font is too small. Now, at that time, you know, we're not going back that far, it was only 2000, although that's, what, 13 years now. We actually had little rules at our desk that we put to show how many characters were in line. I know this is a, you know, glorious job, but back then, you know, we measured the, the text to make sure how many characters fit within an inch of the ruler. And it looked too small. And I, you know, I said, no, it really looks like the font's just, oh, no, 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 it's all right, just submit it, just submit it. All right, we'll submit it. And of course, made my CYA notes to my files. Um, sure enough, the sponsor came back and said, the font type was too small, we're not even going to put the proposal forward for review. Now, for the individual who was submitting the proposal, that was eye-opening. This person, to this day, is still one of our best proponents of font size for National Science Foundation proposals. <laughs> In fact, he, well, every time he would submit a proposal after this fact, he would ask me to look at the size of his font twice just to make sure that it was the right size. So I hate that it happened, but it was an educational experience. <laughs> All right, ready to talk about budget. You, sometimes budget may or may not be important. You may have some sponsors you work with that say, you know, and usually it's not the federal government, but you'll have a sponsor from a foundation and say, I've got three thousand dollars available for you. You know, just submit a letter or a scope of work, what you want to do, and they'll release the three thousand dollars. That's a wonderful fantasy place, and sometimes it happens. But in most cases, the sponsor is going to want to know what you're doing with their money and why you need the amount you're asking for. I usually tell people to try to develop a budget first, get an idea, an outline of their work, and start writing the budget concurrently. Um, or finish the scope of work and then start your budget. I never understood people who started, who did a budget and then built a project around the budget. But unfortunately, in the reality we live in, sometimes that's what happens. A sponsor will say, I've got $100,000 available for you. I wish someone had $100,000 available for me. Um, they'll say that and say, all right, now give us a scope of work for this money. And then you really have to start writing in order to meet the goal of $100,000. So a budget talks about all the costs involved in the project. So for instance, if you're going to get $50,000 from somebody but the project's $100,000, you should be showing where the other 50 is coming from to show all the costs. It also shows your project and how it's going to be accomplished in financial terms. So it should really be a match to what you were proposing. You know, if you're talking your proposal about how you're going to be doing field work in Guatemala, and there's no travel in your budget to go to Guatemala, there is a disconnect. Worse yet, if there's travel in the budget to go to South Africa, and you say you're doing your work in Guatemala, there's a disconnect. So, a budget narrative. This gives details. It's not the forms itself that shows, you know, $5,000 for this, $10,000 for this, in a nice line item format. Um, this is more of a narrative write-up of this individual is asking for $5,000 for salary because they are going to be going to the field in Guatemala 
and they're going to be there for a month and a half, so this will cover their salary. This is the spring back. This is the details that provide backing behind the numbers you're going to have. When you're preparing your budget, you need to do a number of things. One of them is plan carefully. Second, to know the sponsor. Why is it important to know the sponsor? Having worked in this area for a while, I know some of the idiosyncrasies of different agencies and different sponsors, but not all of them. So, you know, we, our office works with people to figure this out. There are some sponsors, and I don't know why this is always the case, there are some sponsors that won't pay the salaries of an individual or every project. Or they'll pay salaries up to a certain amount. Or they'll say, we'll pay for travel, but only up to $2,000. These are the important things to know when you start proposing because if your entire travel is, I keep going back to my field study of Guatemala, if your entire budget is to go to Guatemala for six months to study Columbia Ground Squirrel, $2,000 worth of travel is not going to cut it. So you might want to try to find another sponsor that would be more closely suited to fund your research. And depending on where you are at that time, you have to budget in accordance with your organization's policies. Because over at the state agency, there are certain things we can and can't do when we propose. And there are certain costs that we can and can't propose. So knowing your organizational policies is just as important as knowing what the sponsor will pay. And as I said, a narrative explains each budget line item. Four th three things that you should always remember for cost consideration. Cost should be reasonable. <clears throat> Everybody, I'm assuming at some point, has heard about different audits that happen in institutions because they budgeted or they got awarded something and went to town on what they spent. You need to be reasonable. Budget should reflect good stewardship of someone else's money. I always call this the smell test. You don't want to propose something and get an award and I guess this is called the prudent person test. You don't want to see something splashed across the newspaper because it was something you spent on a contract program. And again, as I mentioned earlier about a total budget, all sorts of the funds that support a project should be reflected. Now, this depends primarily on your sponsor who you're working with or and or what other funding you already have, because for those of you who work in labs with faculty, there's a number of projects that go on in lab at the same time, but they're funded independently, even if there is some crossover of work being done. But this talks more to the lines of if you have one specific project that costs $100,000 and you're going to multiple people to get that funding, you want to be sure that all parties know what the total costs are. Submitting a proposal. We talked a little bit about all the different application types that are both electronic and hard copy. Um, some of the electronic are as simple as the sponsor says, email it to us at this email address. Or as robust as a system where you go in, that's fast money that the National Science Foundation has, where you go in and you upload into a number of different components different pieces of that proposal we already talked about. Others still require hard copy. Thankfully, not as many because, you know, copies and asking for 15 copies of a hard copy proposal that's 30 pages long is pretty onerous for everybody. But there are different ways that we have to have things submitted. And keeping in mind what the organization requirements are so that they can review and approve a proposal. When everything started going electronic a few years ago, um, people started saying, um, from our early faculty, that this is great, everything's electronic, that buys me extra time. Without realizing that, because of course, you know, if you submit a proposal in hard copy and it's due on Friday, you had to express mail it at the latest, which most people did, on Thursday, for it to be received on Friday. But, miraculously, if you have an electronic proposal and it's due on Friday at closing time, at local time, 5 o'clock local time, you actually now have another day to work on it, which is wonderful except for the fact that someone else has to review it. And if that person doesn't get it to review until 4 o'clock on Friday, there are some stresses placed on those individuals who are reviewing that proposal at the last minute. Being the office that gets that stress place, it's not a good place to be. And unfortunately, and this is always, you know, I always share the hard stories. I guess we have to better good stories. You know, we have had in the past issues arise with electronic submission where the proposal came in at the last minute, 
and certain components weren't uploaded correctly, and it was 10 minutes to the deadline, and it was impossible. We tried to make the minute changes as we couldn't get it uploaded, and we submitted it because it had to go, but because those components weren't completed, it was denied before it even got out the door, and the agency we're dealing with does not consider late submissions. And it affected a postdoc salary, it affected um, two other organizations we were working with. So keeping in mind submission requirements and approvals required is very important depending on the agency you're working with. Follow up after submission. You submitted your proposal, it went to the agency. How long do you think it takes before a proposal is reviewed? Or for the whole process from you submitted on, let's say you submitted December 31st. When do you expect to hear back on the success? Six months. Six months. Very good. That's the rule of thumb is six months. Because in most cases, depending on the agency, they've got to pull together a panel, or a committee, they bring people in, or they email them out to people and then bring the group together after that. So for most of the federal agencies, it's six months before you know. Now, that's the rule of thumb. Different sponsors have different requirements. Sometimes they'll say, we're going to let, they'll tell you, we're going to let you know by such and such a date. If they're trying to you obligate money because of Fed fiscal year end, they may turn it around quicker. But the general rule of thumb is six months. So you put your heart and soul into a project. You're all excited about getting out the door. And then you get to sit and wait. Some sponsors will do allow you to contact them and do, you know, ask that you follow up with them at a certain point, but they ask that you wait to a certain time. Because, you know, if you submit your proposal on Friday and on Monday saying, have I heard anything yet? Have I heard anything yet? You know, that's not going to be usually accepted well. But six months is the rule of thumb for submissions, so just be prepared. And finally, what are reviewers looking for? Well, it depends. That's the mantra of my office, it depends. <laughs> Who are your reviewers? If it's a federal agency, it may be program staff, it may be peer reviewed, field readers that they farm out, a foundation board, especially with foundations. I, I came from a foundation before coming here to the dark side. Um, <laughs> I worked for the Ford Foundation for seven years, and any funding that was done through the Ford Foundation, the um, program, they actually had a group of program officers that met, they met with the president once a week and went over different, uh, different opportunities for funding, and they approved them or not approved them and move forward. And that was just from sitting around the big boardroom table and going through each of the proposals. That's probably the, the input of proposals to them is much smaller than that would go to a National Science Foundation or an Institute of Health. But that's how they did it. Then, you know, these are the people who are reviewing. Well, what's their background? What's their age? How much education and training do they have in that area? How were they selected? I say, how, how were they selected? Because sometimes you have people that um, volunteer, others are put through in a pool, others are just sought out. A lot of times agencies will seek out faculty at um, educational institutions to serve on a review panel. And I know a lot of people at Auburn, there's a lot of faculty involved at Auburn in different review panels for federal agencies. How many people review your proposal? Is it just going to be a panel of two people or is it a panel of 22 people? These are all different things that are important to keep in mind when you're writing a proposal. Believe it or not, you need to think, well, why is it important when I write my proposal to know about the review cycle? That comes after. It comes after, but it has true relevance to what you're doing because you want to know ahead of time. And many agencies will tell you, if you go out to certain websites, if you have an idea of what you want to do and you find a source of funding, go out to their website and Google reviews or look up reviewing reviews or grants, and look to see how they review their grants. And then start writing, because think about ahead of time, going back to the three things you need to know, know your sponsor, know your organization, know your project. When you know all the requirements of your sponsor, submitting a proposal gets a little bit easier. And I just thought this was funny. Like I said, I don't tweet, but I did find this funny. And could you imagine, how long is a tweet? Was it 144 characters? How long? How many? See, I was close. I gotta say, for someone who doesn't tweet, that was pretty close. Think of the day in the future where, you know, we don't have to worry about electronic systems or systems or anything else. We could just submit our proposals electronically in a 140-character tweet. <laughs> the documents 
There's some resources I included that you can link to when the document is uploaded. You can go out and look at some of these documents. Some of them, most of them, contain a lot of the information we talked about today. Others have some additional information, but in order to keep to the time limit and keep everybody from throwing things at me, I wanted to keep my talk short and just give you an opportunity to ask questions. Any questions? Good. So in our grant writing class, we talked about the NSF grants and about the, the R01s and modular versus non-modular grants. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he recommended that it's really good to try and avoid writing the modular because it kind of puts you in a new pool of review. Uh, would you say you kind of agree with that or it depends? <laughs> that is my pet answer, is it depends. The difference between a modular grant... Would you mind repeating the question over the Ah, okay. There's a question regarding um, National Science, excuse me, National Institutes of Health has two ways that they submit budgets and proposals. One is in a modular format, which is you don't submit a budget to the National Institute of Health. You basically say how many modules of $25,000 you are asking for. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're asking for $100,000 a year, all NIHCs is $100,000 and some budget narrative on personnel, and that's about it. If you do a full budget, it's back to exactly what I talked about, where you have line items that show each detail, as well as a full budget narrative. I'm not sure... Sorry, I got him backwards. Yeah, he, he said avoid the non avoid. Ah, okay, so I was going to say, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, and that makes more sense, but I'm trying to figure out how to answer that. The question is, are you better submitting a modular budget, which basically just tells the agency, I want $100,000 a year for five years to $500,000, or are you better doing a full budget with a lot of detail? The, the onus behind that is driven by you are required to do a full budget by NIH when your direct costs in a given year exceed $250,000. So if you need $300,000 to do your project, you do have to do a full budget. However, having said that, I think if you can keep it within the modules, it does raise less questions that can be picked apart by the agency. But another caveat is, even though the agency doesn't get a full budget, the university still collects a full budget that we keep on file in our office. And as I told faculty in the past, I know it doesn't have to go to the sponsor, we have to have it for our records because if this gets funded, we have to be able to load an account and just knowing that you need 100,000 is not going to fill one of those. I told them to give it to me on a cocktail napkin, written on crayon, as long as I have something. Only one person's done it in 14 years, and I think it was a joke. I'm not still 100% sure. Um, in those cases, I would say, yes, if you keep it with modular, the burden is less on you, and it does keep an agency from coming back and saying, you guys for $500 for um, calipers, what's that needed for? Or, or someone saying, you know, I know this area of science and saying these three things are needed is irrelevant. So I'd say that's probably wise. Anyone else? Go ahead. Um, I guess uh, I guess my question pertains to what you talked about earlier about the eligibility of certain uh, grants and contracts. And <clears throat> Like I know that I believe the nomenclature for the small disadvantaged business has ceased as of like 2010 or something like that. Now I think they're into like self-registering or something. Mm -hmm. What does that does, yeah, it is a new nomenclature. So sure. Anyway, um, I guess my question is, does the uh, search engine that y'all provide does it does it break out the contracts that are or grants that are uh, available for those type of organizations or? And that's, I don't think we have an internet connection. I was going to go to the website to okay. show you. But if you go out, you can go down to, I don't know if it'll go down, drill down as far as small business, uh -huh. but um, it will drill down to eligibility for for profit. I don't know if that's far enough. But depending on if it's a governmental program, it will normally, it may not be in the search itself until you get to the solicitation. And usually if they have set asides for small businesses, that will be written into that. Yeah. So you might not be able to do a drill down um, from the top. It's, you have to come to the next level to get that drill down. Okay. Are, are you looking for something? Well, yeah. Companies? I mean, I, being disabled, uh, wouldn't mind if you know had that sort of uh, that ability to, to get 
to jump onto those type of that funding as well. And some of the NIH, depending on what area you're assigned to, work with NSF and NIH also have programs yeah. that would be of use. So check that out as well. But also, like I said, go to the website and go to Pivot. Anyone with an Auburn Valley Peak designation, even his graduates, students, undergraduates, because everyone has access in addition to the faculty. Go in and type in some keywords of those areas you work with or that you want to do research in and see what comes up. And there's a lot of fellowships. We find that there's a lot of fellowships that pop up in there, and I know the graduate school puts out a lot of information regarding fellowships and things along those lines. So check it out because, I mean, it's free, you don't have to pay for it. So try that first. Yep, thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else? Well, great, thank you. I'll hang out a few more minutes. I know we're I'm just a little bit over time, but if anyone has an additional question, I'll hang out a few minutes to answer them. Thank you very much. <laughs>